all the delegates from the different parts of the country. Uh, I will be speaking on soil biodiversity uh, theme, which is a soil biodiversity shaping the future food system theme three. And my topic is on biofertilizer application in India for future prospects. Uh, I'm speaking from Indian Institute of Soil Science, uh, which is uh, located in central India. The place is Bhopal. And uh, with me, Dr. Esar Mohanty and Dr. J.K. Thakur, they are my colleagues working on the different aspects of uh, biofertilizers as well as soil biodiversity. I just, since the time is very short, 10 minutes, uh, just I'll briefly, you know, um, uh, biofertilizer in agriculture uh, throughout the world uh, having a lot of importance in the present time uh, because of the increasing cost of fertilizers and also there are many other problems related to fertilizers. So we are talking more on the integrated nutrient management where biofertilizers is one component along with chemical fertilizers, organic manures, different kinds. And when we talk about the Indian context, we have got you know more than 140 million hectares of lands, but major, majority of the farmers are small and marginal farmers and the uh, the, the balanced fertilizers, when we talk the balanced fertilizers based on soil taste uh, and the costly inputs fertilizers, uh, so much fertilizers often would not be used for that. So in that, the biofertilizer is very promising, uh, having a lot of advantages. Uh, uh, India is one of the 12 mega biodiversity countries of the world with only 2.5% of the land area, uh, which is the biodiversity is seven to eight percent of the recorded species of the world, but the problem is that with increasing food productions and the intensive agriculture, the soil carbon is, you know, decreasing, uh, which is now less than about 0.5 percent. As a result, the, the soil fertility, soil health is declining, you know, and that is a matter of concerns. So in this, the role of biofertilizer is enormous. Um, and the small and marginal farmers, as I was telling. And biofertilizers are known to not only improve yields and productive uh, quality of the product, but also improve the nutrient use efficiency. And uh, this is, you know, the it is cheaper and eco-friendly inputs. Uh, so there's a lot of problem in Indian context. And these are some of the, uh, the biofertilizers. Uh, and the, the we have studied uh, our institutes having the all India coordinated research uh, on the biofertilizers and biodiversity. At 18 locations, uh, we are working on the uh, different biofertilizers. And these are the list of biofertilizers, rhizobium, azotobacter, azospirillum, blue glagi. So, and you see the ranges of benefits, 50 to 300 kilogram nitrogen per hectare per year when we apply uh, the rhizobium, uh, uh, along with the different uh, crops like groundnuts, so I mean, these are the different crops and the benefits uh, we have observed, which is highly significant. And this is uh, the most important thing. And uh, you see the, that is why the, the use of biofertilizers in Indian agriculture is very significant. But in, if, we, if you compare the zones of the country uh, where, you know, the, how the biofertilizers are being used and you will find that some of the states are doing very good, some of the areas, See from here, the south zone of India, the increasing, there is increase of biofertilizers. That is because of the, the benefits is the response of the biofertilizers with different uh, uh, scenarios and also the awareness and the benefits which have been observed. So, uh, so there is, you know, increasing in some places, but some places they're almost constant because of different kinds of uh, problems. And, you know, recently a uh, number of biofertilizers has been introduced in the country like, you know, acetobacter, diagiotrophicus, uh, which is endophytic nitrogen fixers in sugarcane. Similarly, the potassium, potassium mobilizers, which is also very much promising uh, as just to, for your information, that 100% um, of the potassium fertilizers is imported to India. So the role of uh, potassium uh, biofertilizers is very, very important. So the lot of work has been done on this aspect and beneficial the uh, organisms which having the potassium mobilizing capacities have been identified and being used. Similarly, the micronutrients and gene solubilizers. And then the, the FT organisms, sometimes the consortia, a mixture of different kinds of yeast, lactobacillus, 
and uh, rhodo uh, pseudomonas they are all excellent for the in the residue degradations and uh, for the fixation of the uh, fixed nutrients solubilizations and the, the the for the promotions for the promotions for increasing the area more of using biofertilizers a lot of lot of schemes government of india is being undertaken some of these examples are that you know uh, that are one and the we develop the national centers for organic farming uh, having different regional centers where the focus is also for increasing the use of biofertilizers on the nitrogen biofertilizers on the phosphorus potassium the micronutrients and different kinds and you know in india just uh, the demand is very high but still the capacity the, the capacity and the production per year is not matching that much so there is a lot of scopes of the uh, the production of uh, biofertilizers increasing production as well as the use almost only the half of the requirements of the biofertilizers uh, uh, is being produced and which could be supplied for the use along with the fertilizers and these are the you know other things is the financial support as well as uh, the financial support is also provided for you know the encouraging encouraging the you know at the demonstrations these are being demonstrated at the farmers fields and also the different kind of you know incentives given the financial supports given so that the bar fertilizers uh, uh, the bar fertilizers units for the production of bar fertilizers can be made and um, and all the their production as well as uh, their applications at the along with the you know the different packages of uh, bar fertilizer applications uh, and so these are some of the uh, setting up of state of the art bar fertilizer units where 100% assistance is given similarly setting up of bar fertilizer testing and quality control or strengthening of existing laboratory units um, under fertilizer control order so here also the majority the maximum amount of the, the assistance uh, given the promotion of fertilizers on farmers fields you know 50% or more cost uh, cost subject to limit of uh, 5000 uh, per hectare uh, each beneficiaries are given so that they understand the the benefits and subsequently they can use so as i was telling you that we have all india connected uh, network project on on uh, soil biodiversity and wi fertilizers these are the different products uh, which have been developed by this institute and these are being manufactured at the different locations uh, of the country given to the industries and uh, and thereby and thereby contributing uh, for the use of bar fertilizers um, in the in india and there are also the recent developments um, on the fertilizer tools in india so there are many different approaches the mechanized seed coat, uh, coating uh, on the different crops and these are the different mechanisms uh, also the lo a lot of lot of you know lot of and awareness about the use of bar fertilizers working with the farmers in the farmers field was telling the small and marginal farmers uh, more about you know 85% where uh, the land holding is about 2 hectares um, my average land holdings of the small and marginal farmers so uh, the balance fertilizers integrated nutrient management where the bar fertilizers should be one you have one minute left ashok please this day for the its methods and conclusion so we heavily depends on the uh, steel chemical the chemical fertilizers and pesticides but the you know overuse and misuse of those uh, are very very you know unfavorable for the quality of the environment where the importance of bar fertilizers in the present time is tremendous as i was telling the role and benefits is well known and that is being you know encouraged and promoted in indian context uh, and but there are a lot of works to be done like you know the selection and effective uh, strains multi uh, which have the multifunctional uh, qualities and different crops different soils different agroecological uh, zones and also the quality control system uh, is very very important often you know often the spurious materials maybe and where this not if it is stored properly and viability of the organisms so that is why of many times 
uh, the farmers, they apply by fertilizers, but they do not get the response. So there are a lot of uh, interventions and control mechanisms. Those things also require that establishment of our fertilizer act also in, the, in India, uh, we are working. So with this few, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, each of you for your kind uh, patience. Thank you very much, much uh, Ashok for this uh, very nice presentation with this uh, country, uh, country vision of the state of the use of biofertilizers, which I, I think that it's very enlightening. Um, we go to the second presentation of today uh, by Mrs. Makipa Raisa from Natural Resources Institute, Finland, with the presentation what the wood microbiota contributes to soil biodiversity. Raisa, the floor is yours. So you can unmute yourself and share your screen, please. Raisa, you have to unmute yourself. Yes, and, and can you, you can start, please. Yes, we we can see your presentation. Please put it in presentation mode, oh, and you can screen. start. Thank you. And can you see the full screen now? Not the, Perfectly. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So my name is Raisa Makita and, and I will talk about what dead wood microbiota contributes to soil biodiversity. So this is not related to, to agriculture, but it's uh, soil biodiversity in forest, forest ecosystems. And we have been studying uh, this kind of stand where we have old growth semi-natural forest with lots of dead wood, which is, which is typical to Norway spruce stands in, in Finland and in, in Northern Europe. And from this particular site, we have identified 2000 species of fungi uh, in this one single stand. And we have analyzed that uh, two thirds of them live in decaying wood. So without this uh, long last substrate dead wood they won't occur in uh, in forest and and especially those one third almost 600 species they exclusively inhabit wood so they don't occur in in, in forest soil and this is uh, what we have analyzed there who who occur in soil and who occur in, in dead wood. And these are just uh, 15 most abundant uh, species. And, and those who uh, uh, inhabit both substrates are here in the middle. And those who are unique to wood are, are on the right-hand side. And on the left-hand side, we have species which are specific to soil. I don't go into the details to the species. Some of you know these when you operate in similar ecosystems, but maybe these are not typical species for tropical agricultural soils. But this is what we, we find in, in boreal uh, forest soil and dead wood. And what happens in, in decaying wood, this is, as I told, long-lasting substrate. Uh, and we classify uh, these decay phases in decay class. First, it's recently fallen, uh, very solid dead wood. And during the decay, uh, density decrease. And in decay class five, this is very soft uh, uh, wood, almost uh, transforming, transforming to soil or organic matter. And what happens to species uh, richness in, in this substrate? In, in wood, it's it's increasing all the time. So the highest biodiversity uh, we see or observe in decay class five. And if we compare that to the soil biodiversity, so soil fungal uh, uh, richness, we see that uh, uh, from soil samples which are taken very close from decaying wood, there is no no any no change during the uh, this decay phase of wood. Sorry, I'm talking about soil, but this is soil sample taken taken just uh, close to wood. And from from area where we don't have uh, uh, decaying wood, uh, species riches is is at similar similar level. 
and more detail about species and function, functionally group view, what we have again are using these decay classes and first is the just recently dead wood, fallen one, and then five is late decay phase. And we see that white rotters dominate in early phase of decay and brown rotters uh, come uh, soon after them. And then we have mycorrhizal species, which are light brown in this figure, and they start to invade uh, decaying wood in, in decay class two, and in late decay phase, uh, decomposing wood is, is inhabited by mycorrhizal species, and they are dominating group. And what happens to species? Here I have uh, 30 most abundant uh, species. Uh, you won't see these names, but these are uh, for different species. And we see that in early phases of decay, there is not dramatic uh, changes in dominant species. But then we, when we uh, go to later decay phase, there is a, uh, a transition to uh, more uh, diverse community and totally different species. And further on in decay class five, which is here, uh, again, different species, and they are very close to common destruction, which we observe from, from soil. This last column here is the uh, abundance of uh, 30 most uh, common species in, in soil. After saying that, it's not a surprise that, that uh, when we analyze uh, stable isotope patterns, we see that uh, decaying wood in early phases from one to three, they are rather similar, but then something happens in late decay phase and, and isotope pattern seems to be closer to that what we observe from soil, which is this cohort here, uh, different uh, uh, locations of soil. And an interpretation of this uh, isotope pattern is that there is the active transfer of nitrogen and carbon between soil and host plants. Further on, we, uh, we have analyzed that in decaying wood, which is originally very solid, uh, hard for microbes during the decay. Uh, there is the asymbiotic nitrogen fixation taking place in decaying wood. And that uh, activity is uh, really strongly dependent on temperature, temperature in all decay phases and optimum is somewhere in 25 degrees Celsius. And it's also highly de de dependent on decay uh, class. So in early decay, nitrogen fixation activity is low and it's highest in uh, in relatively rate, late decay phase uh, and then drop when you go to uh, decay wood which is dominated by mycorrhizal species but anyhow nitrogen fixation activity is, is there and because of this activity we also see that when uh, decay process uh, uh, proceed uh, from early decay to late decay. This is the density which decreased during the decay. Then we observe increasing nitrogen concentration and also amount of nitrogen in, in decay wood increase. So it's partly because of transfer from soil to decaying wood and partly because uh, biological nitrogen fixation. And early, early decay wood is also uh, optimal substrate for seedlings to grow because there are mycorrhizal uh, community available and higher nitrogen concentration or increasing nitrogen concent concentration. So they have also nutrients in there. Uh, I will skip that uh, quickly, just saying that we identified also what species uh, are active in nitrogen fixation and how a uh, number of uh, NIF copies uh, increase with dec decay phase and then decrease in latest decay phase. And our observation is that these uh, uh, species who has capacity to fix nitrogen, they are, uh, many of them are assigned to other rhizobials and, and uh, most common are 
uh, methane oxidizing genera. So we have uh, indirect evidence that there is uh, uh, there are species who has capacity to fix nitrogen and they might use methane as an energy source for for that. But this is indirect evidence for that. And then some conclusion from, from these studies. Uh, we conclude that decaying wood has an important contribution to overall functional diversity uh, in, in forest, forest ecosystems. And many species, a large proportion of species, are, are really dependent on, on this substrate. And, <clears throat> and dead wood special species, so fun functional species specialized on, on dead wood, uh, they might be lost from managed forest where we have very marginal amount of dead wood le le left because of the harvesting. And interaction between soil and wood inhabiting fungi is tight, and we we show evidence that there is active transfer of, of carbon and nitrogen by fungi. And, and microbiota inhabiting dead wood has importance to forest nitrogen cycling because of this uh, asymbiotic, by, asymbiotic nitrogen fixation, which is taking place in, in dead wood. And here are some of the references, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Faisa, for this very interesting talk, because, well, at least for me, it's amazing to know new sources of asymbiotic nitrogen fixation yeah, and how the transfers between wood, soil and plant proceed. So thank you very much. Without any more delay, we are going to the third presentation by uh, Mrs. Esperanza Huerta, Wangan. Uh, she's talking about us about earthworms. Yeah, Esperanza, cuando quieras. Gracias. Okay. Um, hello, good afternoon, good evening, good morning to everybody. So I will uh, try to share my screen. Uh, and... yeah, Raisa, can you? Ah, okay. Yeah, okay. So and now with a mode of presentation. Yes. And then I do this. To the side. <laughs> so yes, um, I will go to the title. Yes, indeed, uh, I will talk about earthworms and um, microbial diversity under conventional and organic farms, and what is the interaction of them in with pesticides in the presence of actual and inherited pesticides. This is a team work done at Pajin University and research, but also with uh, Universidad Politécnica de Cartagena, uh, among and other institutions. Okay, so earthworms as indicators of soil quality. Uh, we know we have heard in this Congress how important are earthworms among all their soil invertebrates, and earthworms are named also soil ecosystem engineers. Okay. Uh, they promote several soil ecosystem services, for instance, organic matter decomposition, infiltration, aeration, and, and, uh, and they can impeccable reflect what occurs above ground. So if there is an affectation above ground, we can see it with the uh, abundancy of soil invertebrates and earthworms can, can inform a lot of that. Okay, soil microorganisms. Uh, we have heard also during the Congress how important are they. Uh, just a previous presentation, we will hear how they participate in the decomposition uh, of material. So uh, they are responsible of different biochemical processes. They interact as the earthworms with the actual and inherited inherited soil conditions. So, but what happened when pesticides are present? So we already know what we have heard that when there is, there is a concentration of pesticides in soils, there is microbial degradation, there is leaching, surface runoff, effect on soil micro and macro fauna, including not target, target species, percolation of pesticides in water table, deterioration of soil properties. So this is some of the affectations uh, mentioned by Miglani and Beach, 2019. Also, just to inform that uh, in soils, 
Unfortunately, we don't have only one type of pesticides. We have a cocktail of pesticides. So this is important to mention because when the studies are done to test uh, a pesticide, they normally do with one, one, only one single pesticide and not with a combination of them. So we don't know really what is happening with the combination with these cocktails over soil invertebrates also over soil organisms. Uh, I invite you when you have time to, to read this work done by um, Hazen et al. 2021. And then uh, there are a cocktail of pesticides in soils. Some of them are actual, some of them inherited. Uh, when I'm talking about inherited, as for instance, DDTs, we still can find DDTs in the soils. So, of course, this is more abundant in the conventional or industrial farms. And in the organic, disfortunately, yes, we can find few, few concentrations, few, 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 but also from the inherited pesticides. Yeah, well, okay. So what was the aim of this study? The aim of this study was to uh, insight of a uh, H 2020 project, International Project Iber Farming. Uh, uh, this project enhanced soil quality, was searching in the enhancing of soil quality through plant diversification and rotation. We also heard this morning in the plenary how important is the diversification and rotation in order to have a diversity in soil. So this project was also promoting these activities. Um, but also assessing earthworms and soil microbial diversity we, we was also an objective in, of this study and of course to assess pesticides residues uh, and in in those areas where they have uh, done line long-term uh, studies no long-term dummy farming farms so long-term rotation long-term diversification so well, the study was done in, in the Netherlands, in Groningen. So we, we can see here the map at the north of the Netherlands. And, and we took the samples in 2018. Okay, so here just to, to have a vision of the different farms. So we have conventional farms and also organic farms and we assess them. So with, Crop, uh, the crops that were present are mainly potatoes. You know that the Netherlands is famous also for the production of potatoes. So we had uh, farms with potatoes and also with fodder for, for animals. So we took samples for microorganisms, samples for earthworms, samples for pesticides, and we uh, determined also the, the, the characteristic, characteristics of the soils. And the pesticide determination was done by this method. Okay, so results. Uh, yeah, in, in relation to the earthworms uh, diversity, we found the highest uh, diversity in the organic farms. So this is something that we normally were expecting. So yeah, the highest diversity in organic farms and also in those farms where they have more years practicing this activity. So this is also very important to say, because sometimes we want to find results in few years, but we need to wait to have a, yeah, a significant results. Uh, yeah, more, more than 10 years, 20 years with this activity, we can have a rich abundance and diversity of earthworms. So this was, this were the species found. Um, I'm not going to go to mention all the names because of the time, but uh, we, we can see that was a, a, a nice diversity. Uh, in contrast, uh, the farms, the conventional farms, they had only one color, so only one species. You can see it also, yeah. Okay, in relation to the microorganisms, yeah. So what we can see here, those farms, organic farms are those here in the middle. So we had the highest abundance, presence, relative abundance of those microorganisms that are nitrogen fi fixation, the, who fix nitrogen. Those are organisms that are related with good practices and with organic matter deposition. Indeed, uh, the map is reflected below ground. So the, 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 those organisms that are more uh, intervening in nitrogen fixation were in the organic farms. 
also here at the right you can see the the, the groups uh -huh. for for instance the protobacteria uh, yeah but because of the time i'm not going to go to mention all the names okay so what about uh, pesticides so we found 17 pesticide residues ddt prosulfur ampa ampa is the first metabolite of glyphosate as you have heard it's an herbicide so we found that also and uh, yeah and in this graph you are seeing the concentration of pesticides and the uh, density of the earthworms. So what is the, the relationship here, uh, grosso modo, is that uh, when you find highest, highest concentrations of pesticides, yeah, it's, it's uh, lower the, the, the density of earthworms. And here, it is very clear here, yeah, how the, the when highest concentrations and cocktails, more diversity of pesticides, you find less, less earthworms. So it is important to mention yeah, this only is not only the concentration, but the diversity of these pesticides. See, eh? like the cocktails is what is damaging uh, the abundance and diversity of earthworms. Okay, so also here clearly the correlation. Now here we are seeing concentration, and here uh, different types of families, but microorganism families. So uh, we can see the highest abundance. The relative abundance is at the left side of the graph, and the, then how the concentration of the pesticides is aumenting, increasing, you see less. Yeah, it's like this. And here at the right. Yeah, Esperanza, the, uh, you have one minute left. Yes, thank you. Almost finished. Yes, yeah, so yeah, the, the right side, you can see the groups of the microns. Thank you. And then this question. Erdoms and microorganisms diversity are clearly influenced by actual and inherited pesticides. When stress factors are present, their biomass abundance and diversity may decrease. So yes, just to mention fast, those are the practices in green that promote diversity below ground. So rotation, perennial crops, no tillage, no chemicals as pesticides. And thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Esperanza, for your uh, complete uh, and uh, comprehensive report on, on this project and the results. Um, we are going to the next uh, speaker, who is uh, Mr. Danilo Augusto Silvestre. And uh, yeah, the floor is yours. You should unmute yourself and put your presentation in a presentation mode, please. Hello. Yeah, we can listen to you. Yeah, it's all okay. clear. Yes, you can start. Thank okay. You. I I I share screen. Okay. You can well, Esperanza, if if you can unshare your screen. That's good. Danilo, you can start whenever you want. you manage? Yeah. One minute, please. Yeah, otherwise, uh, we can upload it from the GSP site, from the meeting site.
Yeah, if, you have, if you have problems, do you want us to upload it? I can find and look for. Yeah. Um, do you prefer that we upload this presentation and then you indicate when to, to, to change the, the slide? Yes. Think that it will be better. Yeah, Isabel, can you manage this, please? Yes, I'm on it. That's good. So, Danilo, you can start whenever you want, and then uh, you indicate uh, when to change the light. The floor is yours, please. Okay. Um... Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Danilo. I'm from Brazil. I'm PhD student agronomy and soil science in the Department of Soil uh, at Federal Rural University of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today to talk about my research. I complete my research in 2019. It was done in the Molecular Microbiology Lab at the University of New Brunswick in Canada with the collaboration of Professor Cheryl Padden. In today's presentation, I'd like to show you the constitution of Nick mutant strain from a cyclotolerant soil bacteria to evaluate the contribution of the biology nitrogen fixation crop plants. The next slide is, yes. okay, thank you. So nitrogen is the major limit nutrient for crop growth. Crops needs high inputs of nitrogen fertilizers. And uh, I know nitrogen fertilization impacts the environment because um, if you introduce a lot of nitrogen fertilizer on the crops production, you can contaminate the soil and agrosystems. Um, biology nitrogen fixation is safe for environment. Uh, it's well new in leg legumes such as soy soybean. However, it's necessary to understand better nitrogen fixed bacteria in non legumes uh, crops uh, such as maize, sugarcane, rice, wheat. Okay, the next, please. So nitrogen fixed bacteria is uh, bacteria I use there is Pseudomonas syringae was isolated from the roots uh, of an Arctic grass in Canada. Pseudomonas is a strong candidate for development as soy inoculant for temperature and cold regions. Uh, some studies uh, with bacteria uh, inoculation of canola, tomatoes, wheat, Eletus uh, has resulted in substantial promotion of satellite, satellite roots growth. Okay, please. This, uh, uh, this slide is a nitrogenase enzyme complex. Uh, it's very, nitrogenase uh, is very, is very important to, um, for biology nitrogen fixation because nitrogen fixed bacteria are able to convert nitrogen from atmosphere to ammonia. Okay, please. Next slide. Here you can see uh, nitrogenase is a uh, structural genes. Nifi, uh, nifi genes, uh, AGK. Okay. And uh, here um, I show I show you Nifi genes locus in Pseudomonas CDA. I use the uh, I delicia, the, the deletion Nifi genes uh, GK in this seat. Okay. Um, so uh, the object, objective of uh, this study 
uh, to construct a mutant of Pseudomonas with the precise markerless deletion of leaf genes encoding the nitrogenase enzyme complex to evaluate the contribution of benefits of biological nitrogen fixation in crops of agriculture portals. Okay. The methodology of this work um, was I use use pseudomonas C, C, C J, 30, uh, 30 degrees for growth, E. coli 37 degrees for growth, uh, media A, L B, a uh, vector with uh, SAC B and G N R uh, genes, and antibiotic. Is sucrose ten percent. Okay. Uh, here, um, here was uh, steps uh, for the construction of these mutants. Uh, first, uh, step one amplify sequences A, B, flunky, MIP genes by PCR. Uh, after that, join A and, A and B fragments by overlap extension using use PCR. Mm -hmm. After that, digest and insert it into suicide vector. And finally, introduce uh, this vector into pseudomonas by electroporation. Okay. Here, um, after after transfer uh, after evaporation, uh, I had transformation of pseudomonas with vector. I plate uh, I strip purify with AOB uh, agar with the uh, antibiotic. After that, I took single colony. I put into media LB. No antibiotic. Uh, after that, I I streak uh, on the plate with LB with sucrose ten percent for first recombination. Uh, after that, I select uh, step five: a replicate plate on well be antibiotic and uh, LB agar with sucrose 10%. Then identify colonies that uh, are sens sens sensitive to antibiotic. And after that, strict purify on well be no antibiotic, and uh, confirm loss of genes by PCR, okay? Result, a uh, PCR product confirms the deletion of MIP genes in the genomic DNA of Pseudomonas. Um, we can see in the letter phrases properly a uh, difference between wheel type and mutant of 4.3 Cabit uh, using any free medium, uh, we can see in the bottle that NIF mutant did, didn't grow, but white type was able to grow in this condition. It can be seen by the change of color from yellow to blue. So it shows that NIF mutant lost its capacity uh, of nitrogen fixing. Okay. Discussion uh, with uh, the construction uh, with the construction of mutants. It's possible to study the contribution of biology nitrogen fixation to crop growth. The transfer of fixed nitrogen from pseudomonas to crop plants would be a significant mechanism for plant growth promotion in this association. 
the effect of transfer fixed nitrogen on nitrogen metabolism in the host plant can be evaluated. Okay. Yeah, you have one minute left, Danilo. Okay. Okay. In conclusion, the addition of Pseudomonas CNJ uh, by all models recombination was confirmed by presence of a 1.2 qubit uh, PCR product, product. Two colonies of the deletion Newton strand were verified by sequence uh, the amplification product. The construction of Newton strand is an important strategy to understand the function of genes on the association between plants and, plants and bacteria. Okay. Uh, would you like to thank you, uh, Professor Shadow Patten, Dr. Veronica Massena Hayes? Would you like to thank you, Professor Leandro Azevedo Santos and Government Brazil, Canada? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Danilo, for this very interesting presentation showing us. Sorry, my. Uh, the detailed methods of how these genetic engineering proce procedures yeah, apply to nitrogen fixation genes work, because uh, normally we stay outside looking at the product, but we don't see how it really works. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, well, uh, we enter the discussion session now. And um, I have seen that several questions have been already answered uh, through the chat. So please have a look. But I have, uh, have uh, chosen some of them. Yeah, in particular, one question to, um, to Ashok Patra, Mr. Ashok Patra. And this question is the following. Um, I wonder if the trend in use of biofertilizers in Northeast India is an increasing because maybe they already use other sustainable practices, such as only certified organic practices in Sikkim. Um, also, are traditional practices also being considered to make the biofertilizer use successful in areas where success has not been observed? So the combined use of biofertilizers with uh, traditional practices. Yeah, if you can uh, give us some information about this, Ashok. Yeah, um, um, you know, in the, uh, of course, in the Northeastern states, you know, uh, the organic, uh, more of the organic agriculture is uh, followed there and is also a um, lot of, lot of uh, uh, you know, emphasis and uh, focus of the government that, you know, and this area use minimum uh, fertilizers and maximum the organic um, practices and uh, uh, and the the use of bio fertilizers uh, uh, not really picked up in the, those because you know in the organic farming uh, the bio fertilizers is also a very important component but uh, uh, and that is also uh, cheaper uh, inexpensive and sustainable, but maybe um, um, one thing is that um, the easily availability in the area and um, the proper uh, demonstrations. Another aspect is the viability, and other this area is you know the acidic soil. Most of these part is acidic soil, highly acidic soils in many parts. So their uh, survival of these different. Uh, biofertilizers in the regions also need to be looked into. So um, uh, different factors are there, uh, the dominant factors to be identified, the why the biofertilizer is not really picking up. That is what I can tell at this moment. Thank you very much, Ashok. Um, I have uh, chosen another, another question for uh, Mrs. Uh, Makipa. And uh, well, she, she already answered this question uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, the references of two, of two papers, but I would like her 
yeah, to, to give more insight into the first question that she got. Uh, the question is, did you identify the specific species with fixed asymbiotic nitrogen in the game wood? And I think that the second question is what uh, I would be interested for, uh, for you to answer. It sounds like the game wood could be used like a source of nitrogen for crops. So what do you think about this possibility of uh, using wood as fertilizer or as an amendment? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, and, and thank you for, for all the questions in the chat. Uh, uh, we identify species who have has capacity to fix nitrogen, but uh, maybe some of you who work with the cropland species and crop species uh, already recognize whether they are common uh, species, what you have seen. I don't know because I have not been working with agricultural soils, but what is interesting for me is that, that uh, these, uh, this, this soil microbiota is the uh, so intelligent, complex that there seem to have uh, uh, bacteria who are using methane and fungi who are producing methane and and others are using methane as a source of energy and and so on. It's a, it's a complex and and interlinkages between species are, are really um, are really great. And in our system, when we have this decaying wood where nitrogen fixation is taking place, we know that it's a favorable substrate for tree seedlings. And, and so tree seedlings with their mycorrhizal, they might benefit from these nitrogen fixing bacteria already in our system. But that's linkage to the our crop species trees. So they might be useful, but I think that by studying uh, agroecosystem in your region, you might find uh, directly those uh, species what you need there. Thank you very much. Yeah, so there's still some research to do to see if it can be used in agriculture. Thank you. Um, well, I have seen that most of the other questions have been uh, being uh, um, answered on the chat. But I would like uh, our last speaker, Mr. Daniel Augusto Silvestre, to answer one question before passing to the second hour uh, of our um, of uh, our session, our part of the session. Um, well, uh, the first one was what target plants were covered in the aim of this study. And uh, if you are planning to do greenhouse experiments comparing nitrogen fertilizer and uh, be sitting here with the plants. So Danilo, if you can. Okay. Um, I, 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 uh, I do not use the, any plants. Uh, I did have no time. But I usually like to test in other crops. Crops, for example, canola. It's, a, it's better association with bacteria, pseudomonas. And I would like. I I would like to test. Okay. Ashok, can you please can you please mute yourself? Thank you. Uh, I, I would like to pass in on, on greenhouse with the crops uh, uh, using nitrogen fertilizer and is uh, is a bacteria from the uh, grasses, and it, it was isolated 30 years ago. But uh, there, there is uh, there is very little study about these bacteria in, in genetic is manipulated. Is um, to compare nitrogen fertilizer. With the uh, together bacteria. Yeah, 
¿Ya? Okay. Okay, that's okay. that's all. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, you can look at the chat for the answers to the rest of the questions. Since we are a little bit uh, short of time, well, we have recovered a little bit the time before um, that we lost at the beginning, but uh, we we'll pass to the second to the second hour of our parallel session five so for those that uh, are coming in for the second hour that switch it from other sessions um it's a pleasure to welcome you to this second hour and uh my name is rosmaria pock i am the chair of the itps of the global soil partnership and I will moderate this um, last hour session. Um, well, I will kindly remind the presenters to keep to the 10 minutes so that we have time for the question and answer session, which is very important. And then I will, uh, I will tell you at the minute nine of your intervention that uh, you have only one minute left. Um, before starting the second hour, I kindly ask you to check the Zoom chat. You should click to the icon at the bottom of your screen, and then there will be some rules and information coming up. And uh, for the question and answer question, please, when you have a question to any of the presenters, write the name of the presenter and then post your question on the on the chat yeah? they will be collected and then at the end of the four presentations we'll be choosing some of them for the for the discussion for the live discussion the rest of the questions the presenters should answer them directly on the chat uh, the host of the meeting is uh, julie Tay. is here he is here to help you for any technical issues on the video and the sound whatever so write to her directly using the chat with a direct message to her mm -hmm. and then uh, without further delay i would like now to give the floor to uh mr manuel languita maiso from spain uh so manuel uh yeah. get us <laughs> Muy bien, gracias. Hey, everyone, I'm going to share the presentation. Uh, can you see properly? It's okay? Yes, it's very clear. So you can start. Okay. So, uh, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Manuel Anguita Maeso. I came from the Institute of Sustainable Agriculture in Spain. And I'm going to present this work that is called Soil Physiochemical Properties, Seasonality, Plant Niche, and Plant Genotype affect bacterial fungal communities in olive orchard soil. But uh, let's start wondering, why olive tree? Well, I'll give you several reasons. The first one is because it keeps the landscape conservation. It's a millenary crop. It can be cultivated in less accessible areas, promoting the soil section. It serves as an ecological niche for uh, other species. And because olive oil and table oil are the basic food for the Mediterranean diet. Uh, talking about olive oil production, we observe that the European Union is the main producer of olive oil in the world, followed with by Tunisia and Turkey. And uh, Spain is the main producer uh, in Europe and in uh, taking into account the Mediterranean Basin countries, followed with by uh, Italy and Greece. However, this uh, productivity and the phytosanitary status of olive trees is being affected currently by several pathogens, among which we can find uh, verticillium dahlia, that is a soil-borne vascular fungus that causes verticillium wheel. There are several factors that can influence the development of this disease. The plant age, it has higher incidence in plants between 2 and 10 years. Soil humidity, it's increased in an uh, irrigated uh, soil. The soil and air temperature, the properly is a uh, 25 uh, degrees, and the crop management that it's increased with tillage. The symptoms of the disease start with the chlorosis and necrosis of the leaves, of the leaves, followed with by the death of the branches, and finally the death of the whole tree because of the obstruction of sealant vessel where the sealant sap flows. Uh, 
Uh, on the other hand, olive, olive uh, like other living organisms, is colonized by a series of microbial communities that we call microbiome. This uh, microorganism can be beneficial, neutral, and helpful for the host plant, can break into the host uh, through the rhizosphere and the phytosphere, mobilizing in the, within the ceiling vessel. Uh, in addition, they interact each other and with a biotic, um, a biotic factor to um, express a series of um, key responses that affect on plant growth and plant health. So uh, my hypothesis is that the olive ceiling microbiome can be used as a biocontrol strategy to mitigate or suppress the development of uh, verticillium wilt. And the objective of this work is to characterize the effect of soil physical chemical properties, seasonality, plant needs, plant genotype on the assembly and shift of the bacterial fungal communities present in olive uh, located in the south of Spain. So the experimental uh, design and the methodology start in the south of Spain, in the, uh, specifically in the province of Jaén, and we selected uh, three uh, olive genotypes widely uh, cultivated in Spain, that are Picual, Arbequina, and Frontoyo. Uh, each of these genotypes came from the same mother plant, so they share the same microbiome within each genotype. We uh, selected four trees for the genotype, and from each tree, we collected samples of root, rhizosphere, uh, and soil in Chuchang in autumn and in spring. The uh, the, uh, the sample uh, uh, different uh, each sample uh, followed different treatment. The soil were drying and uh, shielding, um, then go underwent directly to the DNA extraction. Uh, the, we uh, the bark the the root and we made a small woody chip with a sterile scalpel, uh, doing a extract that was used for DNA extraction. And with the resource first, we insert in the sterile water. And after sonicating, we create an extra that we use for DNA extraction too. Then we perform the 16S and ITS libraries, the sequencing, and the bioinformatics statistical analysis. And the result so that the, in talking about the bacteria taxonomic affiliation, uh, we observe these uh, three uh, main phyla, protobacteria, tinobacteria, and bacteroidetes. And we observe that these three phyla reduces its relative abundance between autumn to spring. Uh, we also identify uh, 271 uh, genera, and we observe that uh, these genera uh, differ according to olive genotype and plant niche, being in Arbequina, the genotype with the most uh, genera and the plant niche in the, in the soil. Talking about now uh, about uh, fungal community, we observe that Basidiomycota, Mortilomycota, and Ascomycota were the three main phyla. And uh, Basidiomycota increased its relative abundance from autumn to spring, while uh, Mortilomycota and Ascomycota decreased uh, its relative abundance. Here, talking about the fungal communities, we detected a total of 106 genera, and, and that vary according to genotype and plant niche too. In, in this case, Piquala arbequina show a similar uh, genera, and uh, the same occurred with uh, plant niche in soil and the rhizosphere. It's were, uh, quite similar. Also, we uh, measure different soil physical chemical properties, and uh, we detected uh, uh, a significant increase of uh, PhD between autumn and spring, while uh, we observe a decrease in uh, organic matter, nitrate, magnesium, and sodium. Uh, in addition, uh, we observe a, a significant increase of calcium in soil under Piquat uh, genotype and uh, reduction of copper and the soil of uh, Frontoyo um, genotype. The richness and diversity, we, according to the richness and diversity, we observe uh, less uh, richness and diversity in fungal community in contrast to the bacteria, and also the root where the plant needs uh, less abundant. According to the seasonality, we observe that uh, a slightly reduction of the uh, richness and diversity in bacteria from autumn to spring, but uh, this uh, region and diversity remain quite similar when talking about uh, fungal communities. The principal coordinate analysis of weight unifrag this the beta diversity, give us the, uh, the uh, significant in olive plant needs. So we observe that the olive plant needs were significant in both uh, population, while uh, the season sample resulted significant only for bacterial community, but not in uh, fungal communities. 
and the oligogenotype has a mean on effect in this uh, uh, structure of the population. So uh, uh, the, my final conclusion is that uh, bacteria community so a uh, higher um, diversity that fungal community in soil rhizosphere and root that microbial community vary mainly according to plant needs. Um, showing the greatest diversity, uh, the soil showing the greatest diversity followed by the rhizosphere and the roots, that the fungal communities were less affected by, to uh, environmental changes uh, due to seasonality, while the bacteria population resulted uh, significantly affected, and that the host plant genotype had a minimum effect of the microbiome composition. Although we observe that uh, different uh, genotypes presented different microbial community each one. So as a final, I would like to share with you this take home message is that indicating only that the uh, plant needs and seasonality strongly affected the diversity and abundance of distribution of microbial communities, while the olive genotype so a relative minor role as a driver of uh, microbiome composition. Thank you for uh, my group, all the uh, institutions that funded this uh, project. And this is my mail and my Twitter account if you want to keep updated with all my research. Thank you. Thank you very much, Man Manuel. You have been very fast. You have finished even <laughs> before 10 minutes or before the, eight, the nine minutes. And uh, also thank you for your well-illustrated presentation showing us the factors controlling soil microbioma and uh, including time and season. So this is not very frequent to find. And also nice to know that they vary depending on the olive variety, which is also very interesting. Um, Okay, we are going to the second presentation of the second session. Uh, so I will give the floor to uh, Mrs. Linda Maria Dimitrova from the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. Um, so the floor is yours. And you can start talking about perennial crops for sustainable soil management. Symbiotic fungi benefit from cultivation of perennial cereal in Europe. Yeah, so you can start. So good afternoon. Thank you for this uh, very nice and important conference. And thank you for inviting me to, to speak about our research. So my name is Linda Maria Dimitrova Mortensson, and I'm affiliated at the Swedish University of Agricultural Science in the southernmost of Sweden. Uh, okay, now it's moving. So perennial crops are um, more and more often suggested to then be- Then we cannot see your, your presentation. We can only see your, your outlook currently. Okay, that's not very helpful. <laughs> Let me try again. Okay, is it better now? Yes. Good, thank you. So I start from the beginning. My name is Linda Maria uh, from Sweden. And um, so perennial crops are more and more often uh, suggested to be introduced into our crop production to provide different benefits, uh, especially to the soil ecosystem and also the surrounding environment. And Tinopurum intermedium, or as it's called with its common, its common name, intermediate wheatgrass, is, uh, is one of those candidates. So this species has been taken in for domestication at the Land Institute in Kansas in the US. And it was selected uh, from a hundred of candidates uh, because of its promising uh, features. Um, so, so now it's enrolled in the, the breeding program of the Land Institute and it is um, uh, aiming to be a, a perennial cereal crop with a, a, um, a, quite, a quite nice um, yield, but also with the benefits of a perennial crop. So it is still under development. So we don't really know where the yields are, are um, landing in the end. Uh, right now, the yields are very low, but the environmental and ecological benefits might be, uh, might be very large. So. 
Um, and, and when the grain is harvested for human consumption, which is the very, very nice thing with this grass, uh, it is trademarked uh, as kunsa. Mm -hmm. My presentation don't want to skip, uh, change slide, but here it is. So in comparison to annual cereal, cereal crops, the perennials, um, they are expected to, to um, provide a range of benefits, as I said, uh, and also to contribute less to the negative uh, influence and agriculture have on the surrounding environment. So for example, the perennial crop is of course uh, expected to, to um, require a lower frequency of, of soil tillage, which will result in lower magnitude of soil perturbation. And potentially because of this perennial feature, these crops will be better at acquiring the nutrients that they, use, they need. Uh, and that means that we, uh, the requirement for additional N inputs uh, as fertilizers uh, is also lower. And taking these two features together, uh, lower tillage and lower fertilization will lead to a lot of benefits such as uh, improved um, organic matter uh, content in the soil and reduced uh, respiration and losses of nutrients via the atmosphere, via the water leaching from the systems and also uh, in the burning of fossil fuels in, in the different production and transportation and distribution. Uh, parts of the process. So these perennials also are expected to, to protect the soil habitats. Uh, and here we have already seen results showing that the soil microbial biomass and, and the diversity in general is higher under the perennial stands compared to the annual cereal stands. Um, and also the mycorrhizal colonization, as, as the previous uh, speaker talked about, uh, also have a better potential to colonize the soil and the roots, uh, contributing to a better nutrient acquisition by the crops. And if we have a more living environment in the soil, the, the capacity of the soil to, to um, provide ecosystem services will also be better such as uh, nutrient delivery, nutrient uh, um, uh, decomposition, uh, uh, and possibly also increased carbon storage. And, and, and possibly there is also, since if the soils are improving uh, to the expected uh, um, account, then the production system in its whole might, might also provide drought resilience being better of taking on a heavy rainfalls and also coping with dry periods. So uh, just to give you a glimpse from our um, research, which is, quite, which is quite new because the crop is new and the production system in, in our fields are uh, also new, we recently started. So, uh, for example, we, we went out in our Swedish uh, fields. Uh, you can see the full scale experiment here. It covers 14 hectares of land, so it's quite large. And we are uh, cultivating this Kurnsa crop. Uh, so we grow it alone, but we grow it also with Lucerne for better uh, nitrogen um, household in the system. But we also sampled uh, a one-year stand of Currency in, in France, together with PhD student Olivier Duchesne uh, at Isara. Well, he's not a PhD student any longer, but he was at the sampling time. So, and Anna Barreiro, my postdoc, uh, she was the one doing all the hard work in the lab, extracting biomarkers for, for example, mycorrhizal fungi in the field, from the field. So. Um, our results, here we have a lot of bars, so I, I have given the most important one a circle. Um, so here we have the, the amount or, or concentration of the bioindicator, the biomarker for mycorrhizal fungi. 
and it's two different. So that's why I have both black and white bars. And in the left, uh, in this first figure, we have the samples from the Swedish experiments. And we can see we have the conventional annual crop rotation, the organic uh, annual crop rotation, and then perennial system and the perennial intercrop, the one with alfalfa as well. So here we can see that we have a, a much higher amount of the biomarker for mycorrhiza uh, when we have the perennial crop. So possibly there is an interaction uh, between the crop and, and this uh, particular group of microorganisms. The results from France to the right, they were not as clear. We can see some um, uh, slightly higher uh, value in the perennial system compares to an annual cereal. But the, the system is rather young, so uh, the soil uh, might need some time for maturing. Uh, and also the annual field uh, was um, um, managed with reduced tillage, which also resembles the, the perennial uh, stand in many ways. So why is this important? Yeah, uh, that's why we all are gathered here today. We want to protect our soils, uh, both because there was something for themselves and the orga organisms inhabiting them, but also because they deliver a lot of different services to us for our survival. And this is what we're doing in our research and we'll do the coming three years in a new project. So we will dig down deep into the soils under perennials to study these different um, uh, aspects of ecosystem services. Uh, so we, we hope that we can be back with, with even more results later. And Olivier and his colleagues uh, has also proposed the uses for, as I said from the beginning, the yields are very low still uh, in this crop. And, um, uh, there is a risk that uh, it will not be taken into the crop production uh, uh, land because it's, it doesn't give the farmer uh, an adequate income. So we are also thinking about how can this crop be used? It can give uh, fodder for animals, it can be uh, used for bioenergy conversion, uh, and then the grain can be consumed as a a niche crop or sold as a niche crop, but it can also be put in the landscape to protect the environment. So we combine uh, environmental protection with production. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Linda. Yeah, you have also been very good in uh, sticking to the time. And uh, thank you also for showing us the additional advantages of perennial crops in Europe and how these uh, additional ecosystem services can be studied and quantified. And thanks also for the nice watercolors in your slides. They were very nice. Thanks. Um, so uh, we go to the following presentation by Mrs. Miriam Memenza, de la Universidad Nacional Agraria, La Molina from Peru, and uh, she will speak us about volatile organic compounds produced by selected antagonistic rhizobacteria against soil-borne phytopathogenic fungi. So uh, Miriam, yeah, there has been a change in the presenter. Yeah, so the presenter will be Miriam Memenza. It's okay, she's around. Okay, thank yeah. you. Good, uh, good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I will present. Uh, let me put in full screen, please. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Miriam Memenza. Today, I will present our research about volatic organic compounds produced by selected uh, right antagonistic rhizobacteria against soil-borne phytopathogenic fungi. This research was developed in the La Universidad Agraria La Molina, Lima, Peru. Okay, uh, we know that fungal pathogens can cause most of the diseases 
that occur in agricultural fields. In my country, Peru, uh, fungal pathogen distribution is very wide, favored by climate conditions, especially the temperature and humidity. These microorganisms are capable of infecting different tissues of plants, causing, uh, causing uh, symptoms such as leaf spoot, rust, wheel, blight, canker, and roots. It's well known that agrochemical has been used to minimize the impact of pathogen fungi on plant health and gel. However, they uh, have adverse effects environment effects, uh, effects and also cause pesticide resistance. For that reason, it's an urgent, to it's an urgent need to reduce the use of pesticides and identify more sustainable crop protection strategies. In this sense, uh, the use of plant growth promoting rights of bacteria could improve the quality of crops. The aim of this study was to elucidate uh, the antagonistic uh, potential of two strains previously isolated from rhizosphere common bean plants. And uh, we, we look for uh, the potential of this strain to produce volatile organic compounds in order to uh, control the mycelial growth of three different fungus, uh, sclerotinia, fusarium, and rhizoctonia. In the methodology, uh, we previously isolated from, from fields located in Viru La Libertad. Uh, these states are located at 76 meters above sea levels. Uh, we, we collected our resulfur samples from the common bean, uh, from the resulfur of common bean plant variety Biochimu. Okay, um, uh, for, from, this, uh, from these two strains, we look for the production of, of volatile organic compounds by the silid play method. Bacteria as late, bacteria as late were uh, cultured in triptych soy broth at 28 degrees Celsius and shaken at uh, 150 RPM overnight. After that, uh, 100 microliters of the bacterial fermentation broth were spread onto the bottom dish of pretty plate containing triptych soy agar. After that, uh, five millimeters of agar plug of freshly uh, growing mycelium was taken from the uh, margin of the colony uh, using a sterile corker border and placed in the center of the of the fresh uh, PDA plate. In, uh, it was uh, then immediately inverted of the, of the bacteria plate and sealed seal it with paraffin. The plates were incubated at 25 uh, degrees Celsius for three to five days. Uh, we also considered uh, controls. Um, uh, the controls were only the, the fungi. Okay, the antagonistic activity bacteria through the production of volatile organic compounds was uh, evaluated every day in order to see the reduction of the mycelial growth. Now, uh, in order to identify the upper field of the, these organic volatile compounds uh, produced by these rhizobacteria strains, able to in, in, inhibit uh, these fungus, we use the gas chromatography combined with a mass spectro, a spectrometer technique. Uh, for that, two millimeters of bacteria suspicion was grown in 25 millimeters of triptych soy uh, broth, culture at 28 uh, degrees Celsius for 24 hours. Then uh, the solid phase microstruction fever was uh, inserted in the health phase deal just above the inoculate medium and allowed to deliberate for 30 minutes. The solid phase uh, microstruction fever then was um, 
insert uh, and dissolve at 70 degrees Celsius for one minute in the injection, in the, in the injection of part of the injector. Uh, we use helium uh, for the carrier gas at constant flow of one millimeter per minute. In the results, the results for strain were able to init a micellar growth of these fungus between 31 to 97 percentage, as you can see. For example, the mycelium of the fusarium uh, was very different. It turns transparent and no pigmentation was observed. In the case of Rhizoctonia and Sclerotinia, we observed that mycelium was inhibited. No? If, if, if you can co uh, compare with the controls, you can see that change in, in the fungus that was uh, in contact with the bacterial uh, colonies. Okay, um, a, a volatile organic compounds profile measured by chromatography in, combina in combination with the mass spectrom uh, spectrometer analysis vary, uh, was different between uh, these, these two strains. In total, we collect, we identify 20, uh, 42 volatile organic compounds. In the case of the first strain, uh, called uh, TBPS 2.4. The this analysis revealed uh, uh, four um, uh, compounds with major abundance. Mm -hmm. um, in this case, uh, we detected a uh, dimethyl um, uh, dilimonate, dimethyl disulfide, uh, metal uh, but butanoid and nonano with a, a major abundance between, between all the, the compounds that we detected by this technique. In the second strain, uh, TB uh, PS 1.6, this analysis revealed uh, also four uh, principal peaks with a major abundance. Uh, in this case, uh, we, detect, we detected a uh, uh, Dimethyl disulfide, uh, dil limonene, ethyl metal butanoate, okay. We also made an observation, a light microscope of, uh, of the chain to, in order to see the change of the mycelium or in the mycelium of the sclerotinia. Uh, in this case, we, we saw uh, 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 Miriam, we saw, uh, un minuto. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. I almost finished. In this case, we, we, we saw uh, morphologic abnormalities in the EFI compared to the controls. No? As you can see, the EFI is more thin uh, and you can see also evacuation of the cytoplasm. Conclusions. These two strains uh, produce 42 vol volatile organic compounds detected by the uh, chromato uh, gas chromatography combined with a mass spectrometer. Uh, from them, uh, there is a very important compounds that you can see, uh, dimethyl, disulfide, delimonin, and two nonanon. No? And they have uh, been reported uh, for being antagonistic, for uh, have antagonistic activity against different soil bore pathogens. This result for us uh, is represent a prelim preliminary screen for the TGPR from the results for of common bean plants in Peru that uh, may um, a start point to optimize the production of bio Bio, bioactive extracellular compounds that inhibit the mycelial growth of these uh, harmful phytopathogens. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Miriam, uh, for this uh, very nice presentation on showing us another way to manage biodiversity by isolating the specific products from rhizobacteria to, find, to fight against uh, pathogens. We hope that uh, further research will be successful. 
Um, well, we will go to the last speaker of today, uh, Mr. Majid Rostami from Malaya University in Iran. Uh, yeah, the floor is yours. Uh, he will speak about the effect of different species of mycorrhizal fungi also on growth or, and physiological characteristics of sorghum in cadmium, cadmium contaminated soil. So uh, whenever you want, you can start. Majid, are you around? I think that there are some problems, maybe. Problems. Can you hear? Yeah, yeah. You, we, we are listening. Your voice, we are hearing you. Okay. You have your presentation ready? Yes. Okay. So, if you can share your screen. You can see. Not yet. You have to go below to the green button, then it's not yet on. If you have problems, we can upload it for you. No, I try to start again. Yeah, if you have problems, we can upload it. Isabel, can you share your screen and then uh, you can tell Isabel to when you want to change the. I oh, know now. Maybe first time he has started. Maybe now. Yes, that's good. Thank you very much. So technology worked. Uh, you. Can you put it in presentation mode and start? Thank yes. you. The floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming here and participating in Global Symposium of Soil Biodiversity. My name is Majid Rostami from Malaya University. And uh, the title of my presentation is Effect of uh, Different Species of Mycorrhiza Fungi Characteristic of Sorghum and Cadmium Contaminated Soil. OK, let's start with introduction and definition. Literally, mycorrhiza means fungus roots. So, myco refer to the fungus and rhiza refer to the plant roots. Therefore, we can define mycorrhiza as a useful relationship between the plant root and fungus. This some symbiotic relationship could establish in the root of so in the root surface or inside the plant root. So, we have two main group of mycorrhiza as you can find here. The first one is ectomycorrhiza. In this group, the hyphae don't penetrate the root cell. And this bilateral association observed in about 10% of plant family. The second type is endomycorrhiza, which uh, in this group more in this group, you can find that a uh, hypha penetrate into the root, and this type are more common, and about 90% uh, of plant have this type of association with fungus. Here you can find uh, mycorrhiza, ectomycorrhiza, and uh, as you see here, in ectomycorrhiza, uh, there is a visible structure that you can see without uh, a microscope. But uh, considering the endomycorrhiza, you have to use a microscope to see uh, different structure of fungus. And this is another picture related to endomycorrhiza. And you can see that in endomycorrhiza, there is different structures such as vesicle and uh, arbuscle. Uh, arbuscle structure have a carol and uh, increase the contact surface area between the hyphae and the cytoplasm of cell. Okay. 
The role of uh, vascular mycorrhiza is to improve uptake and translocation of water and different plant nutrients, such as phosphorus and nitrogen to the plant. But this relationship is not free for the plant. In return, about 20% of photosynthetic product, such as sugar and lipid, are transferred to the fungus. Here, I summarize the key benefit of a mycorrhizal fungi. There are two mechanisms for increasing absorption ability by mycorrhiza. In physical mechanism, mycorrhiza provide a large surface area for absorption of water and nutrient, but chemical mechanism is related to different chemistry of cell membranes in mycorrhiza. I have to mention also that our vascular mycorrhiza uh, have a good ability to enhance plant tolerance for different environmental stress, such as osmotic stress. Uh, in some case, uh, however, this relationship is not uh, beneficial. Uh, uh, for example, when the fungus is harmful for the plant, uh, it uh, acts like a pathogen. And when the plant feed from the fungus, uh, this relationship is not uh, positive. Also, not all of the plants in the world have uh, ability to start a mycorrhiza association. For example, aquatic plant and uh, many of um, hydrophyt are not able to start this type of uh, association. For the terrestrial plant, uh, also we can say that about 90% of plants have this type of ability. So you can find uh, some major important crop among the less 10% that are non-mycorrhizal plant. For example, sugar beet and canola are among the plant that uh, couldn't establish this type of relationship. This is the result of a different study that I you know, used for literature, literature review. And you can see in all of them, Mycorrhiza have a positive effect on the plant growth, especially in the root growth. Let us start with material method. In order to study the effect of two vascular mycorrhiza species on sorghum plant, under cadmium stress, uh, I do the current experiment as a factorial. And here we have two concentration of cadmium zero and 40 milligram per kilogram of soil and four level of mycorrhiza application in the F0, FO or control. We didn't use any fungi. In the F1 treatment, we use Gelomus massi. And in F2 treatment, we use Gelomus intradices. In F3 treatment, we use simultan simultaneous we use simultaneously Gelomus massae and Gelomus interradesis. So it was collected from a field and dried and sterilized in order to delete the native microorganisms. And all of the physiological measurement was done, were done based on the scientific method. I know that we have short time, so I'll pass to the result. Here you can find uh, summarized result. As you see in this slide, in cadmium contaminated soil, relative water content of leaf significantly was lower than soil without cadmium. Different mycorrhiza treatment, increased relative water content. In cadmium contaminated soil, the highest amount of relative water content. This one. was measured after co-inoculation with both of mycorrhiza species. In the absence of uh, cadmium, mycorrhiza treatment here, did a significant effect on chlorophyll content, but under the cadmium stress condition, as you find here, as a result of application of mycorrhiza, 
the leaf chlorophyll content increased. And this is, uh, you can find the catalyst activity in normal condition and without uh, cadmium stress. This one. The catalyst activity significantly was lower. And in this condition, uh, mycorrhiza application didn't have any effect on enzyme activity. But under the cadmium stress condition, this. The catalyst activity increased, decreased significantly after application of mycorrhiza. You know, when we applicate mycorrhiza, the activity of catalyst significantly decreased, and it means that plant tolerant uh, and plant faced with a lower stress condition. Cadmium stress significantly decreased the root weight. In the absence of cadmium mycorrhiza treatment, didn't have significant difference. But in contaminated soil, co inoculation with both of mycorrhiza species, in this one, significantly increased the root dry weight. Leaf phosphorus content. Under cadmium stress condition was lower than cadmium free treatment in the absence and presence of cadmium. Application of mycorrhiza signif significantly increased phosphorus content. Here you can see that even when we didn't have cadmium stress, this one, application of mycorrhiza increase the phosphorus content. Here you can find the relationship between the root biomass and phosphorus uptake or phosphorus content. Higher root biomass uh, resulted, as you find here- You have uh, one minute left, Majid. Okay, uh, yeah, finish. The higher root biomass resulted in higher phosphorus in leaf and so leaf of sorghum. And finally, uh, see the change in the shoot dry weight in different treatments. Shoot dry weight in contaminated soil significantly was lower than uncontaminated soil. In both soil, application of mycorrhiza increased the shoot dry weight, but only in contaminated soil. Simultaneous application of two mycorrhiza species significantly increased the shoot bio biomass. In conclusion, I can say that application of arbuscular mycorrhiza improved the studied characteristics of uh, sorghum. The positive effect of mycorrhiza treatment in contaminated soil was higher and under cadmium stress condition, monoinoculation with Colomus massae or Colomus intradesis had less positive effect on plant growth. So uh, I can suggest that uh, simultaneous application of different species of arbuscular mycorrhiza to enhance plant growth in contaminated soil is recommendable. Thank you for your attention and I'm at your service for any question. That's very good. Thank you very much uh, for, uh, well, at the beginning for your comprehensive review on the role of the mycorrhiza and also how can they can be managed in a synergistic way, yeah, to uh to improve the productivity of sorghum on contaminated soils um okay uh well i have here some questions on the chat some of them have already been been answered um i will start with the last one yeah that i have now on the screen um, is in Spanish, but I'm going to translate it for Majid. Yeah, the mycorrhiza, mycorrhiza through what mechanism it could reduce the content of cadmium in these plants? I don't know if the effect is uh, or the process is the 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 removal of cadmium or that they can grow with cadmium in the environment. So, could you please answer this question? 
And the role of mycorrhiza is that mycorrhiza absorb cadmium and uh, in the root uh, surface, but didn't translocate this uh, absorbed cadmium to the aerial part of the plant. And in this case, plant can tolerate more. Okay. Uh, I hope it has been understood. I will shortly do in, in Spanish. Uh, la mycorrhiza absorbe el cadmio y lo transmite a las, a las partes aéreas y, y no le genera ningún efecto adverso. Ok, um, then I will, yeah, many questions, as I said, uh, at least what I noted from the first speaker to Manuel Anguita Maeso, he already answered very, yeah, in a very complete way, the two questions that were on the chat. Then uh, the questions for, um, directed to Linda Maria Dimitrova, uh, she already answered it. Then there are a couple of questions to Mrs. Miriam Mensa. And uh, well, the first one is, uh, can you describe the benefit of using SP in ME instead of using a gas sample for GCMS. Yeah? I don't know exactly what this, I mean, it's not my field of uh, expertise. So uh, could you please answer that, Miriam? Yes. Okay, sí. okay, no problem. Uh, the, the principal difference between those techniques is that uh, the SPM uh, allow us to collect the the mayor of the compounds present in the medium broth is the principal uh, difference because uh, they can, this fiber can absorb a lot of compounds, including the, the compounds that are present in a little uh, quantities. So uh, this is the principal difference that we found. Thank you. Okay, there is a second question for you. Um, the question is, uh, I wonder if you are considering extracting these compounds and testing them as effective biocontrols in greenhouse experiments, as I know that currently some legume plants struggle from fusarium infections, which is a major reason for the low cultivation by some farmers. This will be a breakthrough which is important from the future of legume crops as a protein source, as an, an, a nitrogen source, and uh, great work. Yeah. Uh, it's, okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you for that for that question. Uh, yeah, uh, we already made some um, trade, uh, some made, uh, trials in the greenhouse conditions. We we tested a lot of strains with different uh, abilities, antagonistic abilities, including that uh, production of volatile organic compounds and also another activity like. Uh, production of antifungal compounds, production of the iron clatin, uh, syrup, for example, and production of the uh, hydrolytic enzymes that we saw in the laboratory condition that control the mycelium growth. So we already made some uh, trills in the greenhouse using legumes and other, and, uh, other uh, crops also. And we saw uh, very, very interesting results um, that uh, these this strains uh, demonstrate that can control different diseases caused by these fungus, uh, Rhizoctonia, these solvar fungus. So now we 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 studying that other compounds that uh, could be involved in this antagonistic activity. So uh, especially uh, we try to identify the name of these compounds. So yes, uh, also we made uh, some um, fields, field trails also. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, there is another question in, in, in Spanish for, the, for uh, Majid, yeah. Um, I'm going to translate it. The measurement of glomalin is an indicator that maybe there is a, a decrease of cadmium content in the soil. 
in uh, the question is in your study have you considered the measurement of this protein in the treatments and the content of cadmium in the plant no no we didn't measure this type of protein we just measure the traits related to the plant uh, most uh, uh, physiological traits of sorghum and we didn't measure anything related to the soil no um and then if you look at the chat there is uh, another question for you from maria lisa i already replied this yeah ah you have replayed it yes yes the last Very. one I don't see the answer. Yeah, the AMF fungi results are significantly higher in the cadmium. Can it maybe? Yes, it is possible because when we delete the other microorganisms from the soil, one type of my microorganisms, especially in the, our study, mycorrhiza, will be dominant. And in this case, we we will see the more more positive effect comparing the natural condition of the soil because we delete the other microorganisms from the soil. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, good. So I don't see, thank you very much for all the answers and for the interactive discussions that has been very active in this chat. I also see that there is an open, I have uh, from Erika Bauer, there is an open 24 hours free to join a cafe. Yeah, since we don't have any coffee break, there is a place to to have informal chats. And uh, well, if there are no more questions, if there are not more questions, we would close this session. And uh, first, I would thank warmly all the all the presenters. I think that well, I will try to summarize a little bit. Uh, the, the different aspects. We had very interesting presentations showing the benefits of soil biota in different aspects of food production, mainly nutrient availability, pest control, and uh, grow of crops in polluted soils, and uh, also how we can manage them. Yeah? Some of the presentations today have shown us the inverse relationship between concentration of agrochemicals in the soil and biodiversity. I think that this is a uh, 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 a general trend in most of the presentations, and also the specificity of the soil micro microbiomas, depending even on the species or the cultivar use. Also, in the case of uh, AMF, how they increase productivity and how they can be managed. In relation to the control of fungal pathogens, we have seen how some volatile compounds from rhizobacteria can be isolated and used to act against them. We have been convinced also on the potential of nitrogen fixing bacteria to be used as inoculants to non leguminous plants and thus reducing nitrogen fertilizer inputs. And also on the existence of saprophytic nitrogen fixing fungi living in dead wood. And I want to finish with the results of the first presentation that we have seen that it is possible to convince farmers and governments on the advantages of using biofertilizers as substitutes of agrochemicals for fertilization and pest control. So this technology transfer is possible and can be successful to achieve a more sustainable agriculture and a higher soil biodiversity at the same time. So uh, thank you very much to all. It has been a very fruitful session. And uh, yeah, I hope to meet you tomorrow uh in the last day so thank you very much and uh see you tomorrow thank you see you tomorrow thank you